and uh, in IT for a little bit longer than that. Um, beyond my work stuff, I also am working towards a Bachelor of Education in uh, adult and not uh, post-secondary education with a focus on teaching technical material. So what do you mean by generalist? Not this guy. <laughs> so to paraphrase a famous movie and meme, uh, I have a very non-specific set of skills. Um, I view a generalist as someone w who, within a particular field or profession, uh, is at least to do with cross-pollination. Um, I think it's a safe assumption that, by the fact that you're here, that you are interested in professional <coughs> development in some way. You want to get better at what you do. Um, and you pursue that to some extent. You're coming out to meetings like this, you're probably taking courses, reading books, reading blogs, podcasts maybe, that sort of thing. Um, that all requires time, it requires effort, it requires energy, in some cases it requires money, in some cases it requires a lot of money if you're dealing with university level courses or uh, private training. Uh, those things can get really costly and it's all time consuming and energy consuming and we all have very little of those things. So uh, much like deciding how do you decide what to test, how do you decide what to learn? You need to think about that and you need to think about uh, what your goal is. And if your goal is to be a specialist in a particular area, you're going to focus your efforts and your energy and your money on that area. You're not going to spend a whole bunch of time and money on learning a bunch of skills that don't really fit with that uh, specialty. So, what happened there? There we go, just went to sleep. All right, uh, so if the goal is to be a specialist, yeah, you're gonna spend your time, but if you're aiming to be a generalist, um, you're gonna need to figure out how to spread that out a little bit. Um, the downside also to the whole specialist thing can be that you develop echo chambers. Um, so something that I've, I've observed a little bit, not so much in testing necessarily, but um, in certain industries, uh, particularly in cybersecurity, for example, um, right now there's a little bit of an echo chamber that's kind of formed because they mostly just talk to themselves. And they don't really talk to as much to outside industries and outside groups to understand what they're, what they're doing and how it, that impacts other groups and other departments and other industries. So, so what? Who cares? You know, we're doing our thing, we get our job done, right? So who cares if the, what the impact is? Well, cross-pollination gives us that opportunity to break out of the echo chambers, to break out of not even just within testing, we can break out of the echo chamber of focusing on testing as just the sort of industry itself and start trying to figure out if there are better ways to solve the problems that we have. Because there are problems that have been floating around in software testing, um, at least as long as I've been doing it, and there still seems to be no progress. Um, metrics are a great example. Um, you know, I remember Kem Kainer po posting about this a number of years ago where it was like, okay, well, we don't really have great metrics. We need to solve this problem. It doesn't seem like there's been any traction on that. Maybe, we, maybe the problem isn't something that we can solve on our own. Maybe we need to break out of testing and start talking to other groups. Um, on the metrics thing, actually, uh, as an example, uh, in 2018, I attended the Atlantic Security Conference. Uh, my sort of area of generalizing outside of testing has been cybersecurity, uh, just because it has it holds some interest for me. Um, so I, I attended the conference, and almost every conversation that I had with cybersecurity professionals about the problems that they faced, because that was what I went for. I wanted to understand what kind of problems are you facing, and how, I, so that I could start thinking about how can testing help solve those problems. And I was struck by the similarities of the challenges that they face and the challenges that we face. Um, how do we articulate our value to the organizations that we work for? How do we articulate the value of testing, how, or in their case, security? Um, how do you justify spending all this money that seems to just disappear and there's not really a good artifact that comes out of that? It, you know, lack of security breaches 
doesn't necessarily show up really well as a, hey, we didn't get breached this year. That doesn't sell really well. Um, you know, it, as opposed to having something that you can show and say, yeah, we did this. Um, another one is the struggle to find good metrics. There's much like in software, there are lots of metrics in security and a lot of them suck. A lot of them are useless. And, or they're, even if they're somewhat useful, they're only useful in certain contexts and they're often used out of, out of context. That should sound pretty familiar to anybody who's done software testing and ever tried to do any metrics. Uh, the, division, uh, the divisions internally on, on automation. Everybody here has probably dealt with that argument on one side or the other of, is automation good or bad? What should we do with it? How should we do it? All those questions are happening in the security industry right now. Exact same things that we have dealt with. Different context, but the same basic problems. Um, even the, the machine learning question, they're actually a little bit ahead, I think, uh, in terms of asking, you know, what value does machine learning add? Does it add value? There's certainly lots of vendors who are saying, yeah, our stuff has machine learning. We sprinkled it on top. And, you know, I'm sure there aren't any testers doing that, but, <laughs> but we haven't even done, uh, I don't think as an industry, a ton of work on that, but I think we could. But we also still need to have that conversation about what is the value that we're bringing uh, and what value can that bring and where are the drawbacks? Where are the, what are the risks that we introduce by relying on machine learning? Um, so those questions are already happening in, in <coughs> other industries. So if we were to have more discussions with people outside of the testing silo, I think we'd be able to help ourselves and help others in terms of finding better solutions uh, or, the, or even leverage solutions that have already been come up with. We don't have to reinvent every wheel. We might have to reinvent some, we might have to invent a few things, but we don't always have to do it from the ground up. We might be able to take something and use it wholesale or adapt it. And I think that this is one of the things where we can also contribute outward as well. Um, and this is why I, f I feel it's important to be cross-pollinating. So not just taking, but also giving back. Um, so for example, we are great as an industry at writing. We write artifacts because we have to, right? Bug reports, that's a big one. Security has a huge problem with their, they're trying to grow their, their uh, workforce. Right now there is a huge shortage of jobs in cybersecurity. And so they're hiring everybody they can get, but they don't have good training on writing. And write, their artifacts are the same as ours. They have, they need written documentation to prove that they did what they did and to show how they did it. And without that documentation, they just, it doesn't look like they did anything. They could just be like waving their hands and say, hey, I did stuff. So I, uh, one of the challenges that I heard from a lot of people, especially at the higher levels, was they're not getting uh, good documentation from their new staff. And we can help with that. We can help say, hey, you know what? We had this problem. We kind of, we may not have solved it, but we at least have a solution that you can use, you can leverage. Uh, you know, for anybody who's taken the, the bug advocacy course, there's a lot of skills in that course that can, I think, can directly translate to the security field. So it's not just a case of going to them and saying, hey, can we steal your ideas? But also here, have some ideas, have some, th some concepts. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to learn and teach new skills. Uh, so at that conference, I was introduced to somebody who came up with a really, really cool database fuzzing tool. And I was like, wow, I would never have heard about this except for the fact that I'm at a security conference because I talked to security people. I got to see, I got a new tool in my toolbox. It doesn't cost me anything. And also I, knew, I met somebody cool, which is also a bonus. Uh, I've also spoken at a couple of security conferences now. So I've, uh, we have one in St. John's, uh, Security B-Sides, um, that we run every year. And I've spoken at that one. I also spoke at, at the Atlantic Security Conference, which has helped me develop my presentation skills, which are getting better, I hope. Uh, but that led me to being able to do my talk here. I would not have had the guts to put in a talk to come and talk to you guys today if I hadn't done those two talks prior 
and sort of gotten some experience, gotten some opportunity to get some really good feedback. I, ha I was really lucky. I got some excellent feedback, uh, particularly on my last talk. And so that's where I got something out of it, but I also feel like I contributed it a little bit. So the other part is we get more context. So I don't know how many of you are sort of part of the context-driven school or not, or how far down that particular rabbit hole you may go. I like context. I like working, and I like expanding that context. I like to learn and know more about what I'm doing. So uh, while I've tended to lean towards cybersecurity as sort of my outside silo thing, um, there's no reason that you couldn't be attending meetups for uh, databases or if that's what turns your crank, or networking, or system admin stuff. If that's where maybe uh, you know, a lot of us fell into testing by accident, you know, just because you're not a sysadmin anymore doesn't mean you can't go to the sysadmin meetups, that you can't listen to podcasts, that you can't still participate in that field to a lesser degree maybe, because you're still focusing on testing, but you're still absorbing some of that. Um, and those skills are useful. A uh, prime example is today, actually, just running into some of the technical challenges we ran into earlier. I knew that there was a problem with uh, virtual network adapters. Uh, so I was able to figure out that that's why I wasn't able to do the, the screencast originally. Again, it's one of those things where just those little bits of information can be really useful. Um, I suspect most of us work for companies that sell a product. Well. Your, how well do you understand your customers? Have you ever been to a conference on their area of interest, or their area of expertise, what you're selling? If you haven't, maybe you should see if you can. Maybe you can learn something new about the context of the software that you're testing just by going and listening to the people who have that software or who might want that software. So you can understand the problems they're trying to solve and try to help your development team understand how to address those problems. So context, it's a great thing. So now what? So it's like, okay, great. Uh, so assuming that I've convinced any of you on the merits of this idea, how can you integrate this into your own professional development planning? Uh, my, uh, my suggestion is that you look at, the, uh, at what do you do as a tester day to day? What, what interests you? What grabs your attention? If it grabs your attention, then maybe if, if you're not sure about what to pursue as professional development, maybe go with that. Start with that. Uh, read books. There's plenty of good sources for ebooks out there that are legit free or cheap. You can, and even if they're not, it doesn't hurt to spend a little money on your own professional development, uh, if you can. Uh, go to meetups. Like this one, there's, I mean, you guys are in Kitchener, so Waterloo, so like, you guys have meetups for everything, you know? <laughs> St. John's is, is, is unfortunately a little dried up on that front, but, you know, you have, there's got to be meetups for just about everything you can think of in terms of technical stuff. So once you understand, once you know that, start looking. Just use Google, use your search, like, leverage your, your ability to investigate. Uh, have coffee with people that you work with. You're, you're interested in delving into the database side of things? Great. Go find your DBA or whoever has that expertise. Go and take them out for lunch, take them out for coffee, and just pick their brains. And be upfront with them. Tell them, look, I want to get better at this. I want to learn more about this to make my testing better, to make your life easier. Because, you know, that's what we're usually trying to do, is we're trying to test this stuff so that it doesn't go out bad. But if we understand more about those tools and about those fields, then we can start doing better testing. Um, one of the biggest bonuses that you, I've found out of it as well is networking. Believe it or not, I'm actually pretty introverted. <laughs> I'm not, this is not my comfort zone, but, and neither is networking, but I have gotten so much out of being able to do that networking by being able to have those conversations with people. I've learned a lot about 
other fields in terms of the technical stuff, but also I've learned about other people and what they're just human beings. Just learning about that is, is always a good thing. It's always useful. And I've made some great friendships. Uh, and it, a lot of it has come from attending meetups, attending conferences, and just getting to know people. And they introduce you to other people, and you learn, and you grow, and you just never know where those opportunities are going to take you. Another good way to learn is by doing this, presentations. Uh, so whether you're talking about it internal to your organization, or at a conference, or at a meetup, uh, a practical learning strategy that you can leverage is to take on a beginner challenge. So let's say you've never done automation before, you're, you've never done programming before. Pick a language. I like Python personally, but that's just me. Say, okay, I'm going to do something for a certain amount of time. I'm going to take on a basic challenge and do 30 days or 60 days and then write a report or write a, create a presentation. Um, so my, uh, when I went to the Atlantic Security Conference, I was actually going there as a speaker. Uh, and my talk was about a 30-day uh, challenge where I did 30 minutes of security work every single day. Now, sometimes that was just reading because I'm not an expert in that field by any stretch. So, and also I'm busy, so reading is sometimes the only thing I can get done. But the idea is that I was able to bring that information to a bunch of security professionals at varying levels and say, okay, this is what I saw, this is what I found, these are the things that went well, these are the things I found challenging. Uh, and most of the conferences that I've gone to Generally speaking, you're getting a real breadth of experience and knowledge levels. So you're getting people who are maybe not even in the field yet, who are students, all the way up to the guy who's been doing it for 30 years, uh, who's really just there, maybe just there to meet up with, with other old friends from conferences. But you're going to get that breadth, and you're, everybody might get something different out of that out of that talk. Um, I was really fortunate that the talk that I did a lot of people uh, at sort of like the mid to high level seemed to get value out of the, my talk, which I was really surprised about because they got to hear a perspective that they don't get to hear from very often. They get to hear the higher level stuff about, okay, uh, you know, we need this course, we need that course. They didn't really get to hear about somebody trying to not break in the field exactly, but trying to improve themselves in that field starting from basically zero or near zero. And they said it gave them a lot of useful in things to think about in terms of how do they encourage more people into their industry? How can they better ramp up people? And how they can train better security professionals? So to me, this is a vital part of the cross-pollination. It, the whole idea is that I learned something new because I did 30 days of security stuff, plus I got to do a presentation, so that helped me refine my skills a little bit there. And I, in return, the security industry got value out of what I did by saying, oh, okay, these things might be, might be obvious to us because we've been doing this for 5, 10, 20 years, but they're not obvious to somebody who has no context for security. Uh, so this is how we can also foster better relationships with other industries, with other fields. And I think that's a really important part of, uh, of all of this. So as a general rule, I avoid wordy slides. So I apologize for this one. Uh, nobody wants death by PowerPoint. Um, so I promise only this one and the next one have lots of words on them. Um, so these are just a few of the ideas uh, that I brainstormed uh, in terms of what you might be able to do to sort of pursue more uh, generalist approach and also get into more cross-pollination. Just a sec. So pick up a language, uh, either a new one or any language. Maybe, you know, I'm, a lot of us, uh, myself included, are not programmers by trade. And I mean, I've dabbled in a lot of different languages, but I 
last year I started working more heavily in Python. And you know, it's even if it doesn't really directly apply to your work, it's still useful. It's still uh, useful in information. You never know when that might come in handy. Uh, OWASP top 10. So the OWASP top 10, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, is basically the top 10 security problems uh, in a given year. Um, actually, I think we might do it every two years. But that list hasn't actually changed that much in the last 10 years. They, the, a lot of the stuff that shows up on that list happens over and over again. SQL injection, cross-site scripting, stuff like that. Some of it maybe evolves a little bit, but a lot of the problems are not really changing. So learn about the OWASP top 10 and think about how you could, your company could have been through testing, how you might be able to do some testing on, OK, well, we know this is a problem. How do I test for that? So then you're digging, starting to learn about security. Talk to your BAs, if your company has them. Ours doesn't. Uh, and find out how they learn to do what they do. BAs are often involved in thinking about risk. That's what we do. So why not see how, what their models are? Understand better how they understand, learn about the customer. Those are useful skills for us. Those are things that we can contribute back as well. Because then we can start saying, OK, yeah, the BAs are saying these things. Oh, we've learned about that stuff too. Yeah, they're right. We can give them backup. And they, in return, get a better product, which means, hopefully, less stress for them. Uh, attend developer conferences, even if you're not writing automation, to understand the needs and challenges. So we work with developers. This is, the, the, it's, we wouldn't have jobs without them. We need to better understand what their needs are, what are their problems, and what can we do to help. I think that's a really important part, is to understand how can we help. Uh, and present at non-testing events about software testing. The first talk I ever did was at Security B-Sides in St. John's. Uh, and it was why we needed more software testers in the field, and, but in a security context. Saying, look, most bugs come out of, or most security problems come out of bugs. And not even necessarily security-specific bugs, you know, cross-site scripting and, and SQL injection and all of those sorts of things. Buffer overflows, that, that sort of thing. Those are, those are obvious security things. But like, take, for example, the, um, the issue that Facebook had uh, a number of months ago where it was, the um, videos were being made available publicly when they weren't supposed to be. And it wasn't, any, it wasn't a, one specific bug. It was actually two or three bugs that were chained together that had nothing to do with security. But it was the chaining of those bugs together. And again, that bug comes back to testing. We can look at it and say, OK, this is where we can start saying, hey, we go to a developer conference and say, hey, we're not the enemy. We can help you guys. We, this is what we need from you, and this is what we can give you if we work together. You know, Talking about bug reporting, uh, I've worked with a lot of really great developers who are really great at bug reporting. Some of them really, really suck. It's unfortunate, and, and those are, but those are the people that you need to talk to and start helping them get better at bug writing because it makes our lives easier when we have to test those bugs so that we don't have to go over and say, OK, can you please explain what you mean by broken? So there's a few resources here. Um, so this, just as a heads up, this slide deck will be available uh, after the presentation. I'll share out the link. Um, so the first one there, whether or not you like James Bach, I know he can be a bit of a divisive person in the testing field, but I highly recommend that book if you are looking at a pursuing education on your own. He's got a bit of a bias against the formal education system sometimes, uh, rightly or wrongly. I, I don't tend to agree, but he's entitled to his perspective. But the bottom line is that he does have some really, really good ideas on how to pursue your own education. Uh, so I really recommend reading his book. Just take a little bit, some of it with a little bit of salt. Um, the Field Stones book. So it's not really necessarily directly related to uh, learning on the surface. So it, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, it's by Jerry Weinberg about, and it's all about how he approaches writing, how he, how he approached writing his books. Uh, as you may know, he's written a ton of books. And uh, he 
he developed a method that I've actually found really useful for outside of writing. Um, I haven't written any books, but I do write blog posts from time to time. But I also find it really useful for assembling presentations. Uh, I used it at basically a, a modified version of Fieldstones to develop this presentation uh, using Trello. Uh, so I highly recommend it just for helping organize your thoughts. It's a really, really useful book. Um, as for these two articles, these are just really useful for generally, uh, they're, they're good arguments in my opinion on the value of generalists and what, what value a generalist can bring as opposed to a specialist. So there's a few closing thoughts. Uh, so being a generalist can mean a lack of a clear roadmap. And that can be intimidating. It can be nerve wracking when you're in the middle of it. You never know if what you're pursuing is the right path because there's no map. Or even if you're heading in the right direction. But to my mind, uh, whatever path you choose is the right one at that moment. Uh, what direction you choose is the right direction at that moment. And you can always change direction. You can always take a different path. You can say, OK, look, I pursued this thing. Eh, OK, I'm done with that, and move on. That's the value of being a generalist, is that you can change. You can do something different. You're not invested so much in one thing and one thing only. And if you pursue something else, you're almost throwing everything else away. But being a, pursuing a more generalist approach you get the value of, of having a little bit of everything. Uh, and you might be surprised when something comes up and it's like, oh yeah, that useless thing that I thought was, or that thing I thought was going to be useless from three years ago, oh, that's actually really useful right in this moment. It might never be useful again, but if in that moment it provides you value, that's a good thing. And you never know what you might learn or who you might inspire. Because that's sometimes as valuable or even more valuable is, OK, you might do something cool, but maybe you're going to inspire somebody to do something even cooler. And that, to me, is I think that's really exciting. So uh, if you have some foolish reason to want to follow what I do or what I say, this is generally where I, I am at on the on the tubes. Uh, and so that's pretty much it. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I guess now is the time. <laughs> any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you talked about generalist, do, mm -hmm. do you think taking this to uh, the step, say, where as a tester you're contributing production code, uh, like mm -hmm. where you have teams of people working together to uh, blur the roles a lot more, is it a good approach? Okay, so, the, so, so if I understand your question is basically, is it a good approach, is the generalist approach a good one when you have teams that are highly integrated in terms of um, tasks. So like the tester might be also contributing production code, right? Yep. OK. Um, yes. So short answer, yes. <laughs> Long answer, um, I think that the generalist approach um, does deliver value, especially in those situations where you might be wearing more than one hat, where you might not just be testing, where you might be contributing either automation code, production code, uh, database work, things like that. Or even, you know, especially in situations where you're dealing with uh, DevOps setups. Um, in startup situations, uh, the company I'm in is relatively small. I wear a lot of hats. So I don't do any code, but I also, but I happen to do a lot of the IT stuff in the office. So that, but that's, Part of the idea is that, yeah, I, by pursuing that, you can still deliver, you can deliver more value by being able to do that. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Uh, how visible do you see like, a danger, or maybe not a danger, mm -hmm. just sort of an occurrence of trying to generalize your skills and then coming across something at one point and sort of focusing in on it and then ending up moving 
towards specialization? Is that sort of a common occurrence? Yeah. So, so the, you're, you're asking about whether the risk, what's the risk of finding something really, really cool and sticking with it and becoming a specialist in it, right? Um, yeah, that's a risk. Uh, I don't think it's a problem necessarily if that's what you find, where if you find inspiration and passion there, absolutely nothing wrong with it in my opinion. There's, so this isn't to suggest that generalists are better or generalists are, or that we should have necessarily more generalists than specialists. Not at all. The, the value of the specialist is still really, really high. You need people who have that laser focus, who understand the, the subtle nuances of, of a particular field. That's still really, really important. Um, and so if you end up down that path, if you start going down the, the path of, of programming and you realize, you know what, I actually think I prefer doing that. That's cool. I think that's really, really useful. And I think it's also good because it's still, as long as you remember sort of where you came from, that you can still bring those skills with you. That changing fields or changing focus doesn't necessarily mean you leave what you learned behind. Even being a specialist, you can still have some ge that generalist stuff in your toolbox. It might get real dusty, but it's still useful. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Uh, yep. So you're so just to make sure I understand your question. So you're asking about how do you deal with situations where the organization you're a part of uh, maybe doesn't encourage uh, sort of cross-functional discussion and cross-functional work. Um, that is absolutely a concern. Uh, you know, larger organizations in particular can be. Uh, a little more uh, static, a little more siloed, and that and that can become part of the culture, or it may already be part of the culture, and that's an absolutely uh, that's a, that is a huge problem. Um, I think the solution to that is at the human level. It's the relationship building, and that's partly why I suggested like go to the person and take them out for lunch or take them out for coffee, um, and just have the conversation with them and just try to understand and. Don't just pose it as, I want you to solve this problem, but rather, how can we work together to solve this problem, or how can I help you solve your problem? By giving a little bit, even if you're already busy, because we are all very busy, by giving a little bit, you may be surprised at how much even unofficial cooperation, even if it, at a corporate level, they're like, no, no, you can't do that, I'm pretty sure that if you can do something small to show the value of it and bring that to leadership and say, hey, you know, I've been working with our DBA and we've found a way to uh, improve our testing of the database, then I don't think anybody's going to argue with that if it doesn't cost the company any money. There's not too many places that are going to argue with that if you can prove the value of it. But it, but it is still a challenge, and you, but I think it boils down to the human element. You have to build that relationship. You may have to build relationships with the people who will say no, even if you go to your DBA and say, okay, we've, we've, you make that, you build that relationship, you may still have to build another relationship with s their manager or your manager or some other manager or, or VP or whatever to basically to remove the barriers a little bit. Because some of those barriers do make sense. You don't want everybody to just be kind of going around willy-nilly, especially if you've got a very large company. You do want some focus, but that doesn't mean we can't work together still. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. What's the weirdest thing you could learn about that would be relevant to testing? 
for me. Um, I don't know if it's even all that weird, but it, um, I, I practice Aikido, and I find it very useful for, not so much directly for testing, like, it's not gonna help me solve, solve a problem of a particular bug, like trying to track down the, some root cause or something like that. But what it does is it makes me think about problems in different ways. Um, in Aikido, it's all paired practice, and we work together to solve problems. So we, we work together to learn and get better. Um, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a, 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 there is still conflict in the sense of, you know, the person that we're practicing with is still expected to give us a, a, a good attack, a solid attack. And so that sort of balance is, uh, has helped me in terms of uh, thinking about testing problems in terms of how do I keep that balance of, okay, I am not the developers, I'm not the, a developer, and my job is to help them, but my job is also to make sure that the software is doing what it's supposed to do and only what it's supposed to do, and so what they're, you know, I have to also ha understand that that what feedback I give them may sometimes be not what they want to hear. And so that sort of helps reinforce that. Another part of it too is that in Aikido we, we do, uh, we practice with everybody. So everybody who's shorter, everybody who's taller, stronger, weaker, doesn't matter. We practice with everybody. And so different techniques require different sh modifications based on sizes and strengths and relative ability. And so thinking about, okay, I have this thing I can do, how, are, how, many other way, how many ways can I do that within that? So thinking about that sort of branching uh, has also kind of helped my testing. Any other questions? Yep? You kind of already covered this. Mm -hmm. Yep. You could say it's always like through a developer that goes through their VA and their VA talks to somebody else. Sure. So, so, so you're asking about connecting directly with groups that we might not normally, uh, as testers, talk to. So, as you, for your example, finance, um, or talk, or say marketing, marketing and sales. Um, I think that's another really good one where that tends to go through a filter of, of BAs or, or project management or things like that. And testing doesn't usually talk to them directly. To my mind, there's no reason why you can't. There's no, re there, there's no rule, at least I hope there isn't, <laughs> that says you can't talk to these people. They might say, no, they don't want to talk to you. And that's fine. If they turn you down, that's fine. But if you come to them and say, look, I want to better understand what, what it is that you do and what it is that I can do to give you something better, even indirectly. Because who doesn't want to hear, hey, I, I want to learn about what you do so that I can make your life easier? That seems like a pretty easy sell, um, other than the time thing. And I mean, like I, like I said, we were all busy, so you do need to try and respect their time. So you don't want to say, I want to sit down for a day and, and and pick your brains, but half hour. Take them out, like I said, take them out for coffee, take them out for lunch, pick their brains a little bit. And I think especially the informal conversations are very, very useful. You'll get more out of those as a relationship building exercise than you know, having a very formal meeting. You can, you can have those meetings, but maybe those aren't the ones you lead with. Maybe you lead with more of the informal stuff, like even just, Hey, let's go to the. Can you can you come to the the lunchroom and, and we'll have coffee and and you know chat about what it is that you do and maybe I can help 
figure out a way to do something on my end that makes your life easier. So I think there's, I, th I don't think there's anybody who's off limits. Um, uh, it basically boils down to their, their interest and ability and, and willingness to share what they have. Any other questions? No? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah? So early in your presentation, you mentioned that there is a lack of personnel in the cyberspace. And you, know, you use it as a example to have an individual in the cyberspace and break mm -hmm. off of the silo to the vast population. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the uh, cyberspace is lacking? Why is cybersecurity lacking in people? That's a great question. I don't have any good answers. <laughs> well, I have ideas, <laughs> but I don't have a good answer for you. I think it's a combination of uh, companies are really waking up to the risks that they've been exposed to for a long time and just didn't know it or didn't really realize it or weren't willing to they kind of had their blinders on and didn't want to see it. Um, I think a lot of companies are probably starting to clue in that, hey, this is actually really a, a huge problem. That combined with the ramp up of, of bandwidth in general, um, the movement towards cloud and web apps and things like that, I think a lot, of, a lot of different factors have sort of come into that. The other part of it too is that there isn't a lot, much like testing, there aren't necessarily a lot of clear paths for education. So there are certainly programs out there, and I can't speak to the quality of any of them, good or bad. Um, that's something you'd have to talk to a security person about. But there are, you know, like there's certifications, there's training, but there isn't, and this is something that actually I'm thinking about doing for a different talk for another uh, occasion. Um, but basically the idea is that much like uh, cybersecurity testing doesn't really have a good uh, path that is very clear that like okay I'm in high school I want to go to school to be a tester I would say I did anybody here not fall into testing almost by accident yeah that's what I thought we all kind of fell into this as a hey we're and you know we all love what we do but we didn't start out that way we didn't start out doing this and a lot of other fields have very clear paths of, okay, you want to be a programmer, you go to college and you do this program and that program and, and you're done. Or you go to university and you do this program and that program. Or you go and do a boot camp and you do this and that and then you're, you go and do that. We don't really have that. And uh, uh, I took a course recently as part of my BA, uh, or B Ed, rather, uh, on curriculum development and I think that sort of got my brain going on like, okay, what if we did have that? What if we had a path? And I think cybersecurity is in a very similar position that they, they've got some, I think they probably got better paths than we do. They've got some, there are degree programs and even master's programs, but it's still a little spread out. And the bottom line is that it takes time to learn those skills. It takes time to ramp up. There's still a little bit of a culture of, uh, the hacker, like the classic hacker culture, uh, that, which isn't bad. It's not a bad thing. It just doesn't necessarily lend itself to scaling. Um, and so I think that's probably where, where at least some of that challenge comes from. Any other? Oh, yeah. <coughs> I think the value as well uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe some special product. Yeah. So that usually require us to be a specialist. Yep. So how can we convert the management mm. the company to develop the skill for us to be a generalist? Mm -hmm. How can we share this value? Yeah. So how do we how do we convince the powers that be uh, who might want us to specialize that hey we want to broaden our horizons a little bit? That's a great question because I've, uh, I know that's, that can be a, pr a challenge. And the answer, the simple answer to that is show value. The long, long version of that is 
if you, you'll probably have to take on more than what you are doing and do something outside the box that proves the value of whatever it is you want to pursue. It's, it's risky. There is absolutely a risk because you know, you're going to have to use extra time. Hopefully, you know, it's a beg forgiveness rather than ask permission kind of thing. But, I, and you might have to do it on your own time too. Like that's, depending on, on your work environment and things like that, that's, that's a very real possibility. But I think if you can say, you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, I think I need to pursue this other thing outside, my, outside what you want as a specialization. Here's the value. Here's, here's what I've already done that shows that I can do, that this can deliver value. I think that's for a lot of, com for businesses, ultimately that's what they need. They need to see that whatever it is that you're going to do is adding value, um, which I think is partly why a lot of us have struggled at times because testing, it's hard to show the value of testing sometimes. So you have to work on how do you show that value? And that's, that's a hard one to answer in terms of like how do you add the value? That's something you have to kind of explore and experiment with, I think. Any other? Yeah? It's rather more of an opinion thing rather than a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, talking about security, mm -hmm. um, uh, if I'm trying to uh, test the security of my software, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to uh, get the security of my software, and I'm trying to expand it towards mm -hmm. hacking, yeah. then let's say not only uh, trying to figure out whether the software is fine security-wise mm -hmm. in normal conditions, but trying to actually proactively hack it mm -hmm. and figure out what happened. That's, that's a really good question. Where is the line between a generalist who just happens to know a little bit more about something and a specialist? That line is wherever you decide it is. I think this isn't, this isn't something where it's like a, a professional designation generalist or specialist. I think this is something that you decide for yourself that this is how I want to approach things. Like I've said before, I've, as you can tell, I'm real, I like the cybersecurity stuff. I tend to do a little bit more of that than I do database stuff. I don't, databases, eh, that's very important, just not my thing. But I still call myself a generalist because it's not the only thing I do. It's not the only thing I bring to the testing. There are other areas I dabble with a little bit of virtualization. I dabble in a little bit of networking, things like that. So I think it's a matter of self-identifying and basically saying, this is how I want to approach things. And you don't have to go out there and say, I'm a generalist, bow before me, or I'm a specialist. It's, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's not, it's not about other people and their perspective on it. It's about what, how you sort of, what your mindset is, where your head's at. Um, more so than a specific sort of delineation. Does that answer your question? It, it actually wasn't a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. About, you know, yeah, absolutely. Because I was wondering that it is uh, more dependent on individual's perspective. Yes, and it is. So it's, I guess, difficult to figure out what are the advantages and disadvantages yeah. of it precisely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely dependent on the context of the situation and the context of your personality and the context of what do you want? Who are you and what do you want? Those are, those are very, very useful questions to ask. Anything else? No. Yeah. Um, so I, I like the presentation kind of, as far as I start thinking mm -hmm. different paths where you're going through, so thank you. So I have a comment that I'd like to kind of expand on. Sure. So I think now that um, I've gone more than a decade in, in, uh, in following the short, mm -hmm. I can I can more com comfortably say that I, I, I'm sort of a little bit of a general mm -hmm. because I've gained so much skill yeah. by working for a company in ABC. Sure. And that's that's pretty common in testing yeah, to be so sort of from, yeah. you know, from the 
data was stopped due to uh, pre root of the application security software. Mm -hmm. Like, it was semantic to, to uh, you know, so, uh, now where I am. So, would it be safe to say that the more of a, the more categorized as a journalist, the later in, in, in your career that you're mm -hmm. saying, maybe you're know, like first or second year of the university, it's kind of difficult to. So, uh, I do, so again, I think it goes back to um, you could be a generalist from the first day you start work. Um, I've always considered myself a generalist. I didn't always call myself that. I used to use the term jack of all trades until somebody told me that it actually has a negative connotation, <laughs> which I, I was shocked because I was like, what? No, this is the gr best thing ever. I don't want to be a specialist, at least for me personally. I wouldn't want to specialize because, frankly, I'd probably get bored because I don't want to be just doing that one thing. Um, I, I think that as you mature in your career, like you say, as you've been at it for a while, you do tend to more clearly identify yourself that way, one way or the other. Um, I think when you're early in your career, uh, there's certainly a risk of sort of identifying too hard as I'm a generalist or I'm a specialist. Um, because you're early in your career, you don't know where the world's gonna take you. You don't know where, what jobs you're gonna get. You don't know who you're gonna work with, who's gonna inspire you, what's going to inspire you. So I think for me, it's all, like I said, it's, it's all, I've always been a generalist. I, I've always sort of considered myself one, even if I didn't necessarily use that term. But absolutely, I think it's probably <laughs> With a maturity in a career, regardless of your career, um, I think you do tend to get a better sense of what of that of whether you are really want whether you really are a specialist, whether you want to be a specialist, or whether you want to be more of a generalist. So short, short answer is that you are a senior generalist. In a <laughs> <laughs> senior generalist, I like that. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Uh, yeah. We're wrapping it up. Uh, yeah. So I, I assume you'll stay for another couple. Yeah. Minutes yeah. I'll be around. If anybody has any additional questions. Yep. Um, thank you very much, Matt, and uh, we'll see you all in the morning. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody.